Hello, America. I'm Mark Levin, and welcome to a special Sunday edition of Life, Liberty, and Levin. I appreciate all of you who tune in each and every weekend, every show. It's always my goal to bring you information and analysis you haven't heard yet, but most importantly, the facts. One of my favorite things about this show is I get to bring on my friends who are not only brilliant, but good people and patriots who love this country. So tonight, you'll hear from just a few of many who fit that description. Go. We're here with our friend, Representative Elise Stefanik of New York, House Republican Conference Chair, member of the Armed Services Committee. Elise Stefanik, in Kamala Harris and Tim Walsh, the Democrat Party has decided to serve its radical left-wing kook base and not the American people. Have we ever seen two more radical extremists running for national office in the history of this country? No, Mark. Kamala Harris and Tim Walz are the most radical Democrat ticket in our nation's history. Look at their record. Look at the record of Kamala Harris. She is Joe Biden's open border czar. She owns this catastrophic failure of wide open borders, prioritizing illegals and criminals over law-abiding Americans. People have died in this country, Mark, because of Kamala Harris's Role as Joe Biden's open borders are. If you look at both Kamala Harris and Tim Walz, they support defunding the police. We saw that when Tim Walz served as governor in Minnesota, and we've seen that when Kamala Harris actually raised money to bail out criminals and has stood for defunding the police. On top of that, this inflation crisis across our country, the deciding vote in the U.S. Senate was Kamala Harris while she was vice president for Joe Biden's Inflation Expansion Act. It's the most radical, most socialist Democrat ticket. And that's why it's so incredibly important that all Americans unify and elect President Donald Trump, who will save this country. And these radical leftists don't seem to learn a damn thing. Um, you know, Tim Walsh is a proud socialist. The fact is, so is Kamala Harris. They don't like to use the word, but that's exactly what they are. They're not capitalists. So um, her idea for fixing the economy is more spending. This cockamamie plan for $25,000, won't that heat up the housing market? Won't that create more inflation? Won't that drive up the price of houses? And then she's got this idea about gouging. The packages are too small and so forth and so on. Let me ask you this, Congresswoman. When Donald Trump was president, was there gouging? When Donald Trump was president, was there profiteering? When Donald Trump was president, did we have massive inflation? People couldn't afford gasoline, couldn't afford food. Maybe the problem isn't the economy. Maybe the problem isn't businessmen and employees. Maybe the problem is them. Well, you're exactly right, Mark. And Americans have to ask themselves, were they better off four years ago? The answer was absolutely yes. If you look at the economic strength under President Trump, it was the strongest economy in modern history. You saw wage growth. You saw the highest number of individuals working. And yet we see unemployment ticking up under Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, and importantly, the single biggest economic stress and challenge right now is inflation. And it's a direct result of the trillions of dollars that was spent under Joe Biden working with Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, with Kamala Harris casting that deciding vote for the Inflation Expansion Act. No matter where you go in the country, Mark, whether it's my district in upstate New York, whether it's these key swing districts, key swing states like Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, North Carolina, Georgia as well, people are concerned about inflation. They're struggling to buy groceries. Groceries. They're struggling to make ends meet. They see utilities skyrocketing. You want to talk about Kamala Harris's economic policies. It's trillions of dollars of tax increases on top of the trillions of dollars of tax increases that were included in Kamala Harris's Inflation Expansion Act. She wants to ban fracking in across this country. That would devastate hardworking families in Pennsylvania and across this country and only cause a skyrocketing of energy costs. So the choice is very clear. You saw an economic boom under under President Trump, and we've seen an economic bust and a crisis under Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. And it seems to me that uh, your point is very, very important. Kamala Harris acts like she's not responsible for anything unless it goes well. She acts like she's an observer. She acts like she's the outsider running. She's the problem. Her fingerprints, her DNA are all over this disastrous economy. We even have members of Biden's staff and Biden himself saying, no, she was my lieutenant. She was my right hand gal. She she worked with me on this economy. And then they lie about the economy. Do you think the American people are going to buy the propaganda that's coming from Washington, D.C.? You think they're going to buy the propaganda by these 
these uh, pollsters and these uh, operators, these grifters that they hire on these campaigns. Oh, inflation's behind us. Oh, the economy's doing well. Isn't one trip to the grocery store going to disprove that? One trip to the grocery store disproves that. As families struggle to balance their budget on a weekly and monthly basis, people know no matter what the mainstream media says, no matter what the propaganda from Washington, D.C., New York City, leftist socialists is trying to convince the American people that they're doing well economically, people are smart. Voters across this country are smart, and they know that they've seen this inflation cut in. It's a, it's a wage cut to every worker across this country because our dollar goes uh, less and less when you go to the grocery store. I am shocked. You look at the price of diapers. You look at the uh, lack of access to baby formula. This has hurt working women in this country, young families in this country, Mark. And to say that Kamala Harris doesn't own it, she owns it lock, stock, and barrel. As I said, she was the deciding vote for the Inflation Expansion Act, which caused the highest rate of inflation in my lifetime. She was the last person in the room when Joe Biden made the decision for the catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan. Afghanistan that led directly to the loss of 13 soldiers. And we now have 13 Gold Star families who haven't even been mentioned by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. She is the open border czar that Joe Biden designated. She owns this wide open border. All of these issues are top of the mind for voters. And as she tries to run away from her record, it is important that we hold our leaders accountable for their failures. She gets an F on all of these issues. That's why she's unfit to serve as the next commander in chief and president of the United United States. But what is this obsession, Congresswoman Stefanik, that Kamala Harris has with giving hard-earned taxpayers money to illegal immigrants? They step into the United States, they go on their way, pathway to legalization and citizenship, and she wants to have them to have free health care. Now, when you combine that to her Medicare for all and free health care, and Medicare, according to the trustees, isn't going to survive past another 11 or 12 years. She will collapse the system with illegal aliens, meaning senior citizens today, senior citizens for the next 10 years may not have Medicare. What's that all about? Well, again, this is how socialist Kamala Harris is. This is the most radical ticket, as you pointed out, Mark, and it's about putting Americans last. She is prioritizing illegal immigrants. She is prioritizing criminals. And ultimately, it's hardworking Americans that will foot the bill. That will be trillions of dollars of tax increases. You pointed out an important issue, and that is protecting and preserving Medicare for our seniors. It's Kamala Harris and Joe Biden that raided Medicare care to pay for their green new scam deal in the Inflation Expansion Act. It's Kamala Harris who wants to cancel and take away your private health care insurance to put everyone on government insurance that will only increase health care costs. These are very serious issues for families who already are struggling to make ends meet. A vote for Kamala Harris is a vote to cancel your health insurance. It is a vote to move to socialized medicine. It is a vote for trillions of dollars of tax increases. It is a vote for trillions of dollars going to illegal immigrants rather than American citizens. And as voters learn more about her positions, it is important that they know that that is what they're voting for. That is the choice this November. And that's why it's so important. You look at President Trump. He prioritizes hardworking American families. He is advocating for tax reductions. No tax on tips. That was his proposal that he will get done. He has a record of protecting and securing the border. He will deliver that again, and he will deliver economic strength for families and for seniors. You know, there's a difference between populism and Marxist populism. Donald Trump, in many respects, is a populist with a conservative core. That is, as was Reagan. We serve the people, the people, not some group of people, not some stratum of people, the people. For Kamala Harris, and Bernie Sanders and AOC and Tim Walz, it's about redistribution of wealth, it's about class warfare. And like most regimes that push that agenda, it's the poor and the middle class that subsidize the rich, that subsidize the bureaucracy, that subsidize the politicians. 
while they talk about they're for the people, it is the people that they crush. Isn't that exactly what's going on today? It is exactly what's going on. That is today's Democrat Party, Mark. It's to crush hardworking Americans. If you look at inflation, who that impacts the most, it impacts every American, but it hurts those in the low and middle income classes. And those are the hardest working people in this country. They're working to make ends meet, where the trip to the grocery store, when you see a significant increase of price of bread, price of eggs, just price of groceries, meat, that is cutting away into their hard earned wages as they're working to achieve their American dream, to give their kids a better opportunity. And yet Kamala Harris wants to do trillions of dollars of new taxes. Kamala Harris thinks that she can make better decisions about how to spend money through the government, a bloated, you know, trillion dollar increases in government spending rather than allowing the American people to make those decisions for themselves and their families. Look at this math massive we redistribution of wealth they're trying to pursue with the bailout of student loans. There's no such thing as a free, free tuition in this country. The people that are footing that bill are constituents in my district who did not take out those loans, went into the workforce, are working so hard every single day in the trades often, and yet they're footing the bill for these radicals, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of student loans, which is only costing a skyrocketing of tuition for families who are already working. And what about those families who worked hard to repay their loans? What about those graduates who worked hard to repay the loans? So it's a massive redistribution of wealth. It is socialism. That is why they're the most radical ticket ever in our nation's history. You know, you can't kill the golden goose and expect the golden goose to keep laying golden eggs. And that's their problem. They have their hands around the throat of that goose and they keep squeezing it. The other thing is their absolute dishonesty to the American people. We know what causes inflation, government. We know what causes unemployment, government. We know what causes the price of gasoline to go up, Biden and Harris choking off our energy sector. We know who's responsible for all these things. These things were not happening when Donald Trump was president of the United States. All of a sudden, businesses are gouging. All of a sudden, there's profiteering. All of a sudden, all these things are happening. But under Donald Trump, they did not. Elise Stefanik, I want to thank you for everything you do. You're a great patriot. God bless you, my friend. Thank you, Mark. Well, America, we're here with our friend General Keith Kellogg, who was also a national security advisor in the Trump administration. General Kellogg, war in Europe, potentially war in the Pacific, war in the Middle East. No longer do we have the Monroe Doctrine. Our enemy is on our shores. They're in Cuba, Central America, South America. Their fleets are on our West Coast. Our East Coast, their jets are flying near Alaska. Let me ask you something. Is this the time for a great country like this when the, when the clouds of war are building and building and building and the enemy is getting stronger and stronger and pouring enormous resources into this military? Is this the time to have Kamala Harris as commander-in-chief with absolutely zero knowledge or experience when it comes to defense and national security and geopolitics? Or is it time to have as a vice president a man who when the time came to actually deploy, he turned and he ran? Is this the time for this duo to be leading this nation when it comes to national security and foreign policy? Absolutely not. Mark, thanks for having me on today. That's a great question. Of course it isn't. This is a team that you're seeing right now with Harris and Walsh that is basically an unqualified and a team that is not prepared to govern, a team that is not prepared for any type of action overseas. Look, the way I look at it right now, Mark, if, if looking over the last four years, I think right now the world goes back to what it looks like in 1938, when you had the, the Munich Conference and they came out and they said, peace in our time, and within one year, you were at World War II. That's kind of where we're at today. And the reason we're there is because of the lack of leadership of Joe Biden and his vice president, Kamala Harris, who says every time, oh, I was the last person in the room that talked to the, the president. Sort of like what she said on television right after the Afghanistan debacle. She was the last one in the room. So you've got somebody who's unqualified, hasn't done it before. And then you've got Walsh, who, by the way, when you look at everything he's insinuated, he's implied, it's truly stolen valor. In fact, I made comments on that several times. When you look at somebody like him, it's really almost disgusting. He was a senior non-commissioned officer in the United States military, in the Army, in the National Guard. 
I was fortunate during my military career to command the Army's 82nd Airborne Division. I had incredibly great master sergeants, sergeants majors, first sergeants. They would have taken care of somebody like him very fast because you cannot imply things like he implied that he actually went to war and carried weapons of war. That just is, is truly stolen valor. And my son who fought in Afghanistan, my daughter who fought in Afghanistan, my son-in-law who fought in Afghanistan and Iraq, they feel the same way I do. This is somebody you cannot trust to have any touch on our U.S. military. And then you go back to Harris as commander in chief, absolutely not. She was she was involved. She was responsible. She's you know basically culpable for all of the actions that have happened in the world today, to include what we've seen in the Middle East, to what we're seeing in Europe as well between Russia and Ukraine, and it's very very dangerous. You know it, we're, when we in the last in the four years we were with the Trump administration. Mark, we had pretty good, credible deterrence. Because for deterrence to be credible, you have to have capability, a lot of ships, a lot of tanks, a lot of troops. But also, and most importantly, you have to have will. The will to commit to action when action is needed. Harris has never done that. Walsh has not done that. And, I, and this is what's honest, kind of frightening to me, that the people would want to entrust our national security to people like that. Look, remember when we go and talk about national security, when we get involved in national security, it's not something big out there that's kind of in a, in a cloud you can't figure. Here's down basics. The basics are national security involves your sons, your daughters, your aunts, your uncles, everybody in your family. Our most credible and most important resource we have are our sons and daughters. You have to commit them to action if deterrence fails. And deterrence has failed on this watch. And I put it strictly on the doorstep of Harris and, and Joe Biden as well. We didn't have that four years ago. We do now. You know, General, the first thing Kamala Harris says about her responsibility as border czar is I'm not the border czar. The one responsibility she was given, she failed horribly at. The idea that somebody gets a promotion for such a disastrous record, a promotion to commander-in-chief to oversee the United States military, to oversee the security of the United States, to oversee life and death decisions, to confront a Xi or an On or a Putin or whomever, I guarantee you they are salivating at the opportunity to have Kamala Harris as the commander-in-chief. If Donald Trump had been commander-in-chief the last three and a half years, there would have been no war between Hamas and Israel. Hezbollah would remain in a box. The Abraham Accords would have expanded to include Saudi Arabia. Iran may not even exist under the current leadership. He was economically destroying them. And there would be obviously no Iranian nukes. And Iran wouldn't be supporting Russia and China. They wouldn't be supporting Iran. In other words, the key element of the axis of evil right now wouldn't even exist or certainly wouldn't have the strength to exist. And yet now everything's been turned upside down. Isn't it even worse than appeasement? We're actually funding the enemy. We're funding Iran while we're telling Israel to stand down. Aren't we doing exactly the wrong thing? Yeah, we are, Mark. Look, you have to go back and look at the, the leadership because everything about presidential leadership is very important because it's the personality of the individual involved. Everything you said is true in the fact, in the sense that in four years of Donald J. Trump, that didn't happen because it was a measure of the man. And, and let me do a fast forward because when he was shot and, and when he was wounded, when he was making his speech, at a rally, that showed that when he stood up and said, fight, 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 that shows the character of a man. Unless you've been shot at, you don't realize that. And I have been shot at. And I know what happens when you get shot at and the result from that. And, and that showed Donald J. Trump's true character. You look what Joe Biden has and it's risk aversion. You see Kamala Harris, she doesn't have a record. Look, she was not elected through a primary system. She was appointed by the Democratic Party to be the presidential nominee. And then she picked somebody like Walsh, who avoided combat, and, and then it implied that he was actually in combat. So I go back to Donald J. Trump and the reason why the world was much safer under somebody like a President Trump, because the world, allies and adversaries respected him. But more importantly, our adversaries feared him because they knew he would take very, very hard action if something came up. Remember what he said, and it's fascinating, when he was in the last state of the Union, in the well of the House, 
And he said near the end of the State of the Union speech in 2020, he said, if you attack an American, your life is forfeit. Think about that. And he followed through with that. He didn't say if you kill him, he said if you attack him. Okay, look what's happened. This administration, the Biden-Harris administration, they lost those 13 great Americans at Abbey Gate during the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan. You look at the wounded and dead we've had with attacks on our troops in the, in the Middle East right now. We've said nothing about it. Oh, by the way, there's still five Americans held hostage from the 7 October attack in Israel. Still five. There were at least nine before, but four have passed away. Nothing's been said about them. That would not have happened. That's 10 months. That, that, that would not have happened under Donald J. Trump. So that's the measure of the man that this nation is going to have to select. Who do you want leading this nation? Who do you want protecting this nation? Who do you want to be as our commander in chief? It's pretty clear. I know who I want because I saw what happened in four years under a Trump administration. And this administration, you're not taking a risk because I can understand risks. You're taking a gamble, which is worth. And I don't think America needs to go there. And the Iranian regime is plotting to assassinate Donald Trump. Now, this is amazing and horrifying on several levels. Number one. Notice he's the one they want to assassinate. He's the one they fear. He's the one they don't want in the Oval Office. Him, singularly, him. That's number one. Number two, we still back channel with Iran. We're still trying diplomacy with Iran. We're still talking nukes with Iran. It's an act of war when you're plotting to kill a former president or presidential candidate, and this administration acts like it's just another day in the park, no? Yeah, well, look, the supreme leader of, of Iran, right now, Hamanei, he knows what a Trump administration would look like, and I don't think he wants to go there. But he knows he's got an administration that's very pliable right now because we actually had him in a pretty good box. And we had him in a box because of that great move by Donald J. Trump when we killed Soleimani and reset the stage. They have never recovered from that. And I've got to do a fast shift right on this one. And this is where I think Israel has done something really smart. They have reset deterrence in the region. A lot of people don't realize that, but look, it's been over two weeks since they attacked and killed Hania, who's a leader of Hamas, and then Fahad Shukar, who is the deputy of the number two in, in Hezbollah, and, and Iran has not responded. Why? Because the Israelis have a policy. It's called Dehiya. And what a Dehi is, it is disproportionate escalation when you attack us. And that's exactly what Israel has done. That's exactly what the United States has done. That is exactly what the United States has not done under a Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And that's the track record they've got. And past is like prologue. What, they're, what they've done in the past and performance is a predictor of what they're going to do in the future. And you've got two choices right now. America has two choices. Do you want a very strong, confident leader in a Donald J. Trump? Or do you want somebody who's pliable and is defeatist in a, in a Kamala Harris? General Kellogg, I want to thank you for all your service in the military, post-military, right now. God bless you, my friend. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. Welcome back, America. We're here with our friend Stephen Miller, who is the founder of American First Legal, a great, great organization of which my wife is involved. We're more transparent, you see, than Kamala Harris over here. Anyway, uh, Stephen Miller, here we have Fox. Liberal media claims Kamala Harris was never borders are, contradicting their own reporting. Other news organizations that said she was Time Magazine, USA Today, The New York Times, The New York Daily News, Newsweek, Politico, Axios. Now they say she wasn't. And we have Right Scoop, Garbage Media gets egg on their faces when they try to burn the right of recalling Kamala Border Czar. New York Post, media suddenly changes its tune on calling Kamala Harris the Border Czar despite giving her the title. I think we should call her Kamala Harris the Border Czar whenever we're speaking. She was the Border Czar. It's a disaster. Isn't that her problem? <laughs> yes, Czar Harris is her title. It was her sole responsibility as vice president. In other words, the only actual public duty she was assigned as vice president, I'm not talking about campaign work, was border czar. We all saw the press event where Joe Biden, wearing a mask, sitting around that table, put her in charge of the border. We all remember that they sent 
Kamala Harris abroad to meet with foreign leaders, ostensibly on paper to try to stem the flow of illegal immigration. But of course, now we know it was to accelerate and expand the flow of illegal immigration. Article after article after article correctly described in real time that the, that the most important domestic policy portfolio had been handed from Joe Biden to Kamala Harris. And now they're saying, well, she was only meant to address the root causes. The root cause is the crisis. That's not even a defense. The root cause is the magnet of catch and release that occurred when Joe Biden and Kamala Harris terminated every Trump border security policy. So every time she blathered on for months and months and months, if you can remember this, about the root causes, the root causes, the root causes of illegal immigration, that was the Biden-Harris policy of resettlement when they terminated all of the Trump repatriation and removal policies. There is no citizen in this republic who bears more personal, individual responsibility for the border invasion that has taken place these last nearly four years than Vice President Harris. And Vice President Harris likes to talk up the fact, or her supporters do, or her media do, her race and the fact that she's a woman. Okay, let's embrace that. I agree. She's black and she's a woman. Tell me, how many black and brown women on the border have been sold into slavery, have been sold into sex slavery, have been raped, have been otherwise brutalized on the border, despite the fact that she was the border czar and despite the fact that she was vice president of the United States and never said a damn thing about it? How many? Do we know? Are they even keeping numbers? This is the civil rights issue in the world today. The mass trafficking of women and children from all over the globe. As you point out, of course, they're going to be predominantly individuals who are going to be black and brown, who are being trafficked across the southern border. This is heartbreaking. This is soul crushing. And again, she is the individual who is responsible for this human smuggling and human trafficking catastrophe. And then, of course, on the receiving end, what communities are bearing the brunt of the border invasion? It's, of course, the whole country, the whole working class, the whole middle class. But disproportionately, we know from years and years of data on the impacts of illegal immigration, disproportionately, the burden is falling on Latino American communities and black communities. This is firmly established in the data about the social, economic, public service impacts of large, unskilled, vast, illegal migration. So in every sense, she is sabotaging the interests of American citizens in general and black and Latino citizens in particular. She claims to be concerned about people. She talks about Gaza and so forth. Why doesn't she talk about the United States? Under her watch as border czar, or at least vice president, more than 85,000 young people have gone missing in this country. Where are they? Don't we have a right to ask Kamala Harris? What have you done about it? Where are those children? Remember, Mark, the precipitating event Going back to your first question, for her appointment as border czar was the unprecedented flood of what's known as unaccompanied alien children, UAC, at the southern border, which basically means illegal aliens who are 17 and younger who are ostensibly traveling alone. When the Biden administration came in and they begin to immediately lift. <laughs> Mà tình nhất Mà tình hai
Từ dấu dựa màu xanh Móc một đoạn mẫu xích Mẫu xích thứ 5 Mẫu xích thứ 10 Mẫu xích thứ 15 20 đơn chung một chân Tiếp theo là một bước đơn Lặp lại như vậy cho đến hết hàng Hai bước đơn chung cho lần thứ ba Hai bước đơn chung cho lần thứ năm Hãy subscribe cho kênh Ghiền Mì Gõ Để không bỏ lỡ Các bạn sẽ thừa Đính tóc thứ nhất 